Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We have a great guest all the way from Anchorage, Alaska. Welcome to the show, my good friend, Keith Weinhold. Victor, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. Well, great to have you here. Now, Keith, it's been a while since you were on the show, but boy, have things changed. And I know one of the things that you definitely focus on in the many thousands of folks that you teach is all about inflation. I'd love to dive into that today. But before we do, maybe give a little bit of your backstory and how you got to this point in your journey. Sure. With the way I started out in real estate investing, it's like a lot of people. I didn't know much and I also didn't have a lot of money. But a lot of it harkens back to the quote from the late business philosopher, Jim Rohn, you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. So when I moved from Pennsylvania to Anchorage, I fell in with a group of friends that were pretty aspirational. And two of my closest five, if you will, they had made their first ever property a fourplex building where they lived in one unit and rented out the other three. And I learned that I could do this the same way that they did this with an FHA loan. That way, I only had to make a 3.5% down payment, which is all I could afford, and that's the down payment that I made. I needed to live in one of the four units for at least 12 months to qualify for the financing and have a minimum credit score of at least 580. So that's exactly what I did. I lived in one unit, rented out the other three, and grew from there. And I learned so many lessons that way. When you're on site, you're also the, the landlord, so you need to deal with tenant situations. And then later, financially, what I learned is that I was actually using other people's money three ways at the same time like this. I was using the bank's money for the loan, a 96.5% loan, and my return on the money I borrowed, that's my money, not the bank's. The second way is I was utilizing the tenant's money for the income stream to pay my mortgage and all the expenses. And then the third way I was using other people's money simultaneously is I was using the government's money for very generous tax incentives like deferring capital gains tax and sheltering a portion of my rent income with tax depreciation. So that's how I started out. And that's one of the huge lessons that I learned to build wealth don't focus on getting your money to work for you. Get other people's money to work for you. And some of your audience might have heard that, but they haven't thought about how you're actually utilizing other people's money ethically three ways at the same time. Absolutely. And then I thought I heard you say you had a credit score of 580. I'm just joking. <laughs> well, yeah, it's the minimum credit score of 580. I was doing, doing better than that. But see, I mean, these are qualifications most people have. You don't need any degree or certification, 12 months residency and a minimum of 580. Almost anyone can clear that bar. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And of course, you've scaled that up and you now have a wildly successful show, the Get Rich Education Show. And uh, I believe you are you still on the Forbes Council for Real Estate Experts? Yeah, the Get Rich Education podcast is probably the most successful thing that I've ever done. And yeah, I'm an active participant on the Forbes Real Estate Council, and I've served there for five years. Fabulous. So fast forward to today, you have obviously grown a much larger portfolio than just a fourplex. We're in an absolutely inflationary environment. And I know a lot of folks, even our own team included, are often concerned about what inflation is doing uh, from a cost perspective, will expenses rise faster than rents for a period of time, which can you know put you upside down for at least a period of time. And because at a certain point in an inflationary environment, unless salaries increase to keep pace with inflation, you hit a limit as to how much you can charge in rent. Tenants hit a wall and they can't afford any more. So then that becomes a ceiling. What are your thoughts? Well, yeah, expenses are certainly on the rise. Importantly, when one has a mortgage, you know, I really recommend using leverage and using a mortgage, that real estate investors, just like the homeowners, at least in the United States, your principal and interest, your biggest expense is fixed. Inflation can't touch that principal and interest payment. So one place I often recommend people invest to help hedge against some of these problems if wage growth doesn't keep up with inflation is serving a niche that's kind of just below the median housing value for that area. 
And that way, like, how could you really raise the rent, for example, from $1,600 up to $1,800 if wages are only increasing 5% like they have in the United States recently? Well, there's a few reasons for that. But one way is oftentimes a tenant steps down a class from somewhere else. They might go from higher end class A housing down to your class B minus housing. So they might have been paying $2,500 rent up here in a quasi luxury unit and they'll step down and pay $1,800. So tenants need to be able to step down from somewhere. So that's oftentimes why you don't wanna be at the top for long-term rentals. And maybe you're thinking, well, wait, wouldn't that cause a sacrifice in the standard of living, in the quality of life for that person? Well, yeah, that's exactly what happens in an economic slowdown. There is a measure of austerity there. Well, there is, but then at the same time, there's gonna be very little vacancy in that product category. So the, the ability for people to step down is limited. I guess what you're saying is that you're you're pretty much guaranteed to always be full. Yes. And with that high occupancy, I mean, high occupancy can basically be a, a bid, people bidding for rents. And as we know, with what it takes for a down payment and closing cost to buy a primary residence nowadays, just the median single family home, that might take over 100K. That's a threshold that we have probably crossed taking more people out of that primary residence, first time home buyer pool and potentially putting them in to the renter pool. One reason why rents have been rising faster than historic norms is that right there. Absolutely. Absolutely. What you said absolutely makes sense. I mean, three things happen in an inflationary environment. People's purchasing power for those on fixed income gets wiped out. Savings gets wiped out. And of course, debt gets wiped out, all three of those. So if you're to arrange your affairs in a manner to come out on the winning side of that equation, you obviously want to load up on debt to a responsible level so that you don't end up upside down, but you want to devalue that debt and pay that debt with future dollars that are worth less. Yeah, let's talk about that because I've characterized this as the inflation triple crown, a coin that I've termed and in fact, trademarked. Real estate investors win with inflation three ways at the same time. But but first, just drop it back, The gravity of the problem is very real. Uh, Victor, since last month, I have gone grocery shopping in New York, Pennsylvania, Washington, and Alaska, and my jaw has almost fallen onto the floor with the prices of just everyday consumer items. And yes, this consumer price inflation is somewhat different than asset price inflation, but they are correlated. They are linked. And yes, I'm the proud owner of my first ever bottle of $8 salad dressing, for example, but at least it has the good stuff in it, like extra virgin olive oil and uh, apple cider vinegar. But in any case, it's pretty wise to bet on inflation over the long term. You look at the long term trend of the dollar and the dollar's diminished in purchasing power 97 to 98% over the past 100 years. The classic economist Milton Friedman famously said that real estate is always and everywhere an economic phenomenon. So if we can take this as a given over time, it's important to realize that a lot of people don't think about inflation until it substantially exceeds the Fed's 2% target rate. And you know, Victor, really, I think the word is noticeable. It's not until inflation is noticeable Noticeable, that really- People start talking about it or thinking about it, kind of like me, the the proud owner of an $8 bottle of of salad dressing. Yeah, and absolutely. It's been present all along, even when it was a 2%. Those properties, uh, that debt was being devalued and the appreciation, I won't say the, it wasn't really market appreciation. It's really asset price inflation is is going to the equity holder in uh, in the equation. And that's really where the benefit lies. So- even though you might put together your pro forma, your your spreadsheet that shows what your exit is going to look like, in, oftentimes the reality turns out to be a lot better when you look in inflation-adjusted terms. Yeah, that's right. And you touched on it. Asset price inflation, that is actually the first crown of the inflation triple crown. So how exactly does a real estate investor win with inflation three ways at the same time? Well, it's nothing exotic. It's a rather simple formula. When you as a real estate investor, you buy a property with a loan that produces cash flow, meaning rent income exceeds all expenses. That's the formula for winning the inflation triple crown. And the way that it works is, let's use an example of an investor wants to buy 
one million dollars worth of property. That might be one apartment building or four single family homes. A million dollars worth of property with a 20% down payment, borrowing 800K from the bank. So with the asset price inflation, like you touched on, let's just say we have 10% inflation over a year or more. You can make the argument that that's the true diminished purchasing power of the dollar with the way that the CPI is calculated, but just to keep numbers simple, therefore after year one, your $1 million property just appreciated up to $1.1 million. All right, maybe you're thinking, well, wait a second, so what? If each dollar is worth 10% less and I have 10% more dollars, aren't I just right back where I started? Well, no, and not actually, at all. Because yeah, you, actually, you're right. The answer is no. Yeah, because your debt is still at 800000 Yeah. And in nominal terms, your equity is now 300000 but maybe devalue that by 10%. So it's $270,000 in last year's dollars. So you've made 37% rate of return in one year on your equity without doing anything except waking up and breathing. Right, because you got that loan. So you're actually further ahead. Your 200K in equity just went up to 300K in equity because you have $1.1 million in value minus 800K in debt. So you're the beneficiary that way with asset price inflation. The second of three ways that you're paid is with debt debasement. Your 800K of loan amount that you have to the bank, we know that tenants are paying that down over time on an amortizing loan. But independent of that, if we have 10% inflation, after one year, you don't actually owe the bank 800K in real terms because the bank doesn't have to be repaid in inflation adjusted dollars, just nominal dollars. So therefore, effectively, after a year as wages and prices and salaries are all higher, you really want to owe the bank 720K not 800K on an inflation adjusted basis. So you're getting ahead that way. And then the third leg of the inflation triple crown is cash flow enhancement. And we touched on this a bit earlier, Victor. I'm going to oversimplify it for a moment. And that is the effect where every time you get a $1 rent increase, you might get a $2 cash flow increase, the money that you feel in your pocket every month. That ratio could be two to one or one and a half to one or two and a half to one, but you're probably getting ahead that way. And if you extrapolate that effect across your entire portfolio, there's a big deal. The money that you feel in your pocket every month. And why exactly does that happen? Well, again, it's because your principal and interest payment stays fixed. Again, that's part of the formula, a cash flowing property where you have a loan. So that's the inflation triple crown. The first way is asset price inflation. The second way is debt debasement. And then the third way is this cash flow enhancement benefit that's little understood. That's the inflation triple crown. Absolutely. I love that. Well, I know, uh, Keith, you've got, uh, you always are working on all kinds of resources and uh, folks want to connect if they want to learn more. What's the best way? Listen to the Get Rich Education podcast or check out my free new video course that you can get at getrichseducation.com slash course. Real estate investors, again, just simple buy and hold real estate investing are typically paid five ways at the same time. In fact, I wouldn't even buy a property if I didn't expect to get paid five ways at the same time. And in that video course, you'll get five videos. Each of them are about 12 minutes long, and you'll understand profit centers that you never understood before. So you can get that free at getrichseducation.com slash course, or listen to me every week on the Get Rich Education podcast. Awesome. Well, Keith, love the perspective. And for the listeners at home, definitely connect with Keith at Get Rich Education. And you definitely want to check out the Get Rich Education podcast and download his course, his video course at GetRichEducationPodcast.com slash course. So thank you, Keith. And in the meantime, for the listeners at home, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow. 